Wherever you turn around, it's a sea. It's endless, raging sea. Christ against Satan, good against evil. We're about to discover the last deception of Earth's history. But there is no way out. The entire universe is involved. Welcome to the Central California Conference's Symposium on Final Events. This is the place to be for scholarly, deep insight in final events. Please invite your friends to join us. This is a great opportunity to sit at the feet of renowned professors. For more information on what's coming, or perhaps if you've missed something, you can find the information on our website, www.centralcaliforniaadventist.com forward slash what's next. Please like, subscribe and hit the bell so that you will be kept up to date with what happens in this channel. And we do plan to record and present to you future presentations of a similar nature. Please use this opportunity to reach out to us, to comment. We do value them. We read every single one of them. In fact, we have a team standing ready, waiting to pray for you. Please share your concerns and we'd love to be a part of your life in prayer. But please, we do not seek to get involved in arguments. Tonight, I have the distinct privilege of introducing to you a longtime friend of mine. In fact, we went to college together in the early 90s. Uh, in fact, it may even have been uh, 89 around there because I graduated in 91. So I've known Dr. Kyle Duvall for a very long time. It is a pleasure to introduce Dr. Kyle Duvall to you. He is a senior lecturer in New Testament and postgraduate course convener at Avondale University College, Karubong, New South Wales, Australia. He has worked as a pastor and evangelist in South Africa and New Zealand. He earned his doctorate in theology from the University of Auckland in New Zealand. He has written five books and numerous book chapters and journal articles. His work on mission was translated into German as Mission Umdenken, das Geheimnis der Ersten Christen. I look forward to his presentation tonight on a paradoxical title, The Slain Standing Lamb of Revelation. My name is Kyle Duval, and I'd like to thank Pierre, my uh, old colleague. We studied together at Helderberg College in South Africa for uh, the kind invitation and the opportunity and the privilege to uh, share God's word with you. Today, I want to talk to you about the slain standing lamb of the book of Revelation. And we're going to look specifically at the slain standing lamb in the context of the cosmic conflict. I want to invite you to Revelation chapter 5. If you have your Bible or your device, please turn or slide to Revelation chapter 5, and uh, I'll begin reading. Before we do, as we've turned and uh, prepared ourselves, let's have a prayer together as we open God's Word. Our loving Father, what a joy to talk to you today as our God, as our Father, 
We thank you for your holy word and we thank you for its power to minister into our lives and to transform us for your glory. As we read and study today, may you move upon our hearts and draw us closer to your side. May this revelation be something new for each of us, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name we ask. Amen. Revelation chapter 5. I trust uh, we all have it, and uh, let's reflect on that now. Verse 1 reads, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. May God bless the reading of his to our hearts today. To understand the book of Revelation, we need to look at its context, its historical context. As historicist interpreters of the book of Revelation, historicists being we recognize the overarching plan of salvation beginning in the time of the writer all the way to the consummation, the second coming of Jesus Christ, that prophecies, apocalyptic prophecy in particular, covers that broad sweep of time. Let me suggest, however, that within this framework, meaning-making begins in that historical context, does it not? The book of Revelation was written to seven churches in, in Asia Minor, to, to real Christians in the context of a persecuting, harassing Roman Empire. And so meaning-making must begin in that historical context. However, because the book of Revelation is inspired, because it's authoritative, because it comes to us from God, its message is trans-historical. Its message is applicable to every generation, indeed to your time and to my day as well. Secondly, we also need to look at the, the Old Testament context. In other words, the Bible that John used, the Bible that John loved and studied and reflected on, the Old Testament scriptures, those are the scriptures that are indeed woven into the fabric of the book of Revelation, of the uh, 404 verses of the book of Revelation, 278 of those verses have allusions, not quotations, not citations, not illusions, but allusions to the book of Revelation. And it's those allusions that we need to reflect on because John, in the spirit, in vision, drew on the stories, the concepts, the ideas of the Old Testament in writing and framing the book of Revelation. And then most importantly, Revelation 1 verse 1 provides the paradigm, does it not? It's the revelation of the end times. No, it's not. It's the revelation of uh, the history of the entire global church. No, it's not. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not about dates. It's not about uh, prognosticating the future. It's not about charts. It's about Jesus. In fact, the word revelation means a disclosure, an unveiling of Jesus. Can you think of how beautiful that would have been for John? You know, John had 
walked and talked with Jesus. He had seen his miracles. He had interacted with him. He had laughed. He had shared. He had seen the power, the intimacy, the love of Jesus in three and a half years of dynamic ministry. He knew the earthly Jesus in a very personal, in a very real, in a very special way. Now, this same Jesus, this same Jesus, the resurrected, triumphant, conquering, sinless Lord of heaven and earth, is now the person John saw in vision. Isn't that a wonderful? You know, uh, it's the uh, German scholar, scholar Rudolf Bultmann who questioned the the, uh, exo- the existential nature of the Christian faith when he argued that there was a dichotomy between the Christ of faith and the Christ of history. I put it to you today that John would, would counter Bultmann's views and say that the Christ of history is indeed the Christ of faith because John knew not only the resurrected, triumphant, Lord of history in vision, but he knew the personal Jesus as Lord and Savior who walked upon the earth. There's no difference. The Christ of history is the Christ of faith who lives within your heart and, yes, within mine today. So the book of Revelation is an unveiling of Jesus. And so whether we are studying the seals or the trumpets or the seven last plagues, whatever it is we are reading, we need to discover Jesus, our Lord, our friend, and our Savior. And today we look at a very pertinent passage, Revelation chapter 5, that reveals Jesus in all of his regal splendor, in all of his magnificent beauty. So there's three principles for you. Historical context the Old Testament context, and a Jesus focus as we study the book of Revelation in this presentation. In fact, uh, my colleague and friend uh, John Pauline suggests it is only when the Old Testament background is understood that Revelation can be expected to heal secrets that may have been perfectly clear to the first century reader. The setting then of chapter 5, I suggest to you, it symbolizes the inauguration of the heavenly temple in AD 31. Remember, Revelation is symbolic. It's not literal. Of course, seven literal churches, seven real groups of Christ followers in Western Asia Minor. The book is written in symbolic language, and we need to keep that in mind. So Revelation chapter 5 symbolically depicts the beginning, the inauguration of Christ's high priestly ministry, which is so beautifully portrayed in the book of Hebrews. It points, in fact, to the enthronement of Christ as the heavenly king. And so before the seals are opened, before the trumpets are blown, before the uh, cataclysmic events of Revelation 12, 13, 14 are depicted, we have Revelation chapter 5, the throne room from which God governs, and controls the universe. I remind you today that this planet is in the hands of the nail-pierced Savior, Jesus Christ. He is guiding, he is leading. Not only this planet, not only the, the planets careening through space in this Milky Way, not only the universe, but he's guiding in your life. And he's guiding in my experience. He is in charge as the narrative of Revelation unfolds. The throne room here in Revelation chapter 5. Let's pick it up at verse 1. John writes that I saw in the right hand of him was set on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. The symbols in Revelation are, are complex, and I believe we, we rob the, the book of its, uh, of, its, of its richness, of its complexity, when we attempt to uh, decode the book, when we attempt to find a one-to-one correspondence between the symbol 
in Revelation and perhaps our own day. Remember, the book is not primarily written to us. So we cannot read the newspaper, pick up the headlines on on the internet or watch NBC or CNN and then suppose that what we see in the headlines is being portrayed in the book of Revelation. Scholarly circles, we call that eisegesis. You know, reading into the text what we want to see there. Rather, we need to do exegesis. And that Greek word suggests we draw out meaning from the text. We let the text speak. It's inspired. It's given to us by God. Let's prayerfully and respectfully approach the text. So we may hear not from the headlines of men, but so we may hear from God, the lifeline of God through his Holy Spirit. And so the scroll certainly portrayed the uh, first century reality of perhaps a father who passed on and had his will and wanted his will to be read to his family. His will would be sealed. And upon his death, his family would be able to, would be able to open the seals, break the seals, as it were, and read the scroll, and an executor would be able to carry out, to execute that will. So beyond the first century context, let's have a look at the, uh, let's have a look at the, uh, the, the Old Testament context. But notice now that there's one who has this scroll in the right hand, and in fact, he's seated on a throne. Noted uh, Revelation scholar Sigvi Tonstad suggests that the scroll is contested territory in the book of Revelation. And the scroll, uh, pardon me, the throne reminds us of Isaiah 14. And the sinister desire there of the evil one to usurp the place of God. It's fascinating then that right here in Revelation 5, we find this throne is... uh, is being challenged. This throne is uh, is being contested for in what we term a cosmic conflict between good and evil, between God and Satan. And we want to unpack in a little more detail the significance of the slain standing lamb in this cosmic conflict between good and evil, this cosmic conflict between right and wrong. So the throne symbolizes this conflict But, you know, at a practical level, at a practical level today, the throne of your heart and the throne of my heart is under contestation as well, is it not? Who has your loyalty? Who has my allegiance? And in this cosmic conflict, not between two powers, between two ideologies, between two allegiances, but rather between two ears, yours and mine, Who has your heart? Who has my allegiance today? The wonderful thing of Scripture is that we recognize God as the creator of heaven and earth. And yet he says, my son, my daughter, give me your heart. So the throne is under under challenge as we begin our exploration here in Revelation chapter 5. We've we've touched briefly on the first century context of the scroll as uh, my father passing on and wanting to execute his will. But but let's look now at the Old Testament background. And here we draw on the work of uh, Rankel Stefanovic. Rankel suggests that the covenant scroll is being depicted here in the Old Testament context of Deuteronomy 17 and 2 Kings chapter 11, and the covenant scroll is the scroll that the king took as he commenced his rulership. The king would read the covenant scroll and in effect declare, with God's help and power, I will execute the covenant scroll. I will carry out the expectations that God has upon me as king. As I begin my rulership, I will read the scroll and make sure with God's help I carry it out. And so I suggest that we need to bring this first century context, this 
Old Testament context of, of the notion of will here to Revelation chapter 5 as we begin to make meaning. Revelation 5, 2 informs us of a mighty angel. Now only two other instances where there's a mighty angel in 10, 1 and in 18, 1. In 10, 1, it's the, uh, the end of prophetic time. And in 18, 1, it will be it will be an announcement of a mighty angel. And the fourth angel's message will be proclaimed across the earth. So a mighty angel only appears when something, something big is going to happen. And we expect the same here in Revelation chapter 5. Verse 3, but no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside. Verse 4, I wept and I wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Notice that this idea of worthy connects us back to Revelation 4, verse 11, where John declared there, only God is worthy. God the creator. So the implication here in 5.2 is, you know, who's like God? Who's as worthy as God? Of course, the implication to take it further is that someone can open the scroll then who, is, who has the standing, the authority of God, someone who has intrinsic worthiness, someone who has the nature and the character of God to open the scroll and to execute the plan, the plan of redemption, the covenant scroll, God's eternal covenant for the human family. Who can execute God's will? Someone who is equal to him. I want you to notice as we as we reflect for a moment on the fact that John weeps. And this is uncontrollable sobbing. John weeps because there's no one who is worthy. No one was worthy. And it appears in vision at that moment for John that the plan of salvation has, has hit a wall. It's, 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 it's being derailed. The plan of salvation will not be able to be executed because there's no one equal to God. There's no one who is as worthy as God. There's no one capable of opening the scroll and executing its contents. So John weeps in vision. He weeps. And then we turn, of course, to verse 5. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David is triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Now, you know, we've already suggested that the Old Testament context is important for us as we try to make meaning in the book of Revelation. And so when we seek to understand that Old Testament story or concept or idea, we need to go to that wider context, the literary context, the thematic context. It's a wonderful uh, principle brought into English scholarship by C.H. Dodd back in the 1950s. The wider context from which an allusion or quotation is drawn from the Old Testament, that wider context must be considered as we make meaning. So I want to suggest to you today that we need to look at this idea of Judah. Why Judah? What's significant about the story of Judah And can we reflect on the story of Judah in the context of Genesis? And how will it help us to understand the symbol and what's going on here in Revelation chapter 5? I don't want to run ahead of myself there and say lamb. But how does it help us to understand this symbol? Well, let's go to that story now. And we want to look at three snippets. Three snippets in relation to... uh, the story of Judah, and we go first now to Genesis 37. Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? 
Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. So here's the opening snippet, the opening episode. And of course, this is when Joseph just arrives to see his brothers after being sent there by his dad. By his dad, pardon me. This is the this is the message that's being sent by Judah in relation to Joseph. I want you to notice that uh, Judah is just concerned about profit. He's concerned about hiding his and his brother's behavior. He's concerned about perhaps making a profit, selling him to the Ishmaelites. He's concerned about keeping his own record, his own, you know what I mean, clean and making sure that he is not implicated in any way. Uh, These are some of the the, the motives, it appears, for why Judah says what he says in Genesis 37. Genesis 38 chronicles Judah's downward moral spiral, ending with his admission of his wickedness and his hypocrisy in Genesis 37 and verse 26. Let's look at the second snippet of uh, of Judah's life. And this is now an encounter with his dad in Genesis 43. Judah said to Israel, his father, send the boy with me, speaking of Benjamin, and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. Do you notice the change in Benjamin, the tone the way in which he speaks? Do you notice the care, the concern? Do you notice the fact that Benjamin is willing now to accept blame if things fall apart, if things go wrong? And then let's look at Genesis 44, where he records again again once more the words he speaks and here in front of Joseph this time. I became a pledge of safety for the boy to my father, saying, if I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord, and let the boy go back with his brothers. Notice Judah's readiness to sacrifice, to put himself into slavery instead of abandon his brother, is in fact a critical turning point in the narrative. Scholars like Victor Hamilton Lawrence Turner, all of these uh, Old Testament scholars acknowledge the central importance of this moment in Judah's story in the narrative. Let's begin to draw now that Old Testament context of Genesis and the story of Judah here to Revelation chapter 5. As Judah became a pledge of safety for his younger brother Benjamin, so the Lamb is the pledge of safety for people. Judah came to offer himself to free his brother, so the Lamb offers himself to free his people. Genesis, in fact, then presents the transformation of Judah as the prophetic precursor to the future Davidic king and ultimately, ultimately to the Lamb. So we brought that Old Testament context of the story of Judah and it helps us to understand what's happening in the book of Revelation and in Revelation chapter 5 in particular. You see, this is how we study the book. We study the book by allowing Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Holy Spirit is the ultimate author of this book, is he not? He is the one who guides us and leads us into all truth. And as we allow the, 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 the Spirit of God to unpack Scripture for us, allowing Scripture to interpret Scripture, you and I begin to see new facets of meaning, new vistas begin to open up on the on the uh, exegetical horizon as the book of revelation opens up and we see now as these vistas un- open up for us 
we begin to see this revelation, this revelation of Jesus. And in fact, uh, Peter calls him, you know, the morning star. John will call him in chapter 22, the bright and morning star. And you know, that's the purpose of all prophecy, isn't it? For the bright and morning star to arise and shine ever brighter from your heart and from my life, from your experience and from my walk with God. Let's look at verse 6 now. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. A lamb, seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. You know, apocalyptic symbols are compressed, rich and deep meaning within their density. And we need to pause and carefully study each of the symbols to understand what God is saying to us. I'm not in favor of a, of a simple one-to-one correspondence of trying to understand the symbols and, and rob them of their meaning potential, rob them of their ability to speak into our lives and allow God to, to transform our heart, to transform our lives. In fact, that's going to be one of my punchlines down the track that God desires the transformation of your heart and the transformation of my heart as we engage Scripture, as we engage these symbols, and as they unveil Jesus, as they disclose Jesus to us. So let's reflect a little more. Why does John, for the, for the symbol of lamb, you know, why doesn't he use the Greek term amnos? Why does he use the term anion for lamb? I put it to you that John has used this term anion because one of the antagonists, the chief antagonist, in fact, in the book of Revelation, is a beast called Thurion. And so in this cosmic conflict, it will be anion versus Thurion. It will be the lamb versus the beast. It will be the small, timid animal, seemingly insignificant and inconsequential versus this big, grotesque, violent beast. The cosmic conflict being being portrayed uh, dynamically and powerfully at the level of symbol. Look at the Greek word here for slain, sfadzo. Look at what it means to butcher, to slaughter, to maim violently. Brutality committed against the lamb provides insight into the horrors of sin and the depth of the sacrifice of the Lamb. Looking as if it had been slain. The Greek word there is fad me not. It conveys the idea of the ever-suffering Lamb. Notice the depth and the meaning and the significance of the suffering of the Lamb. I tell you what, I wish I wasn't seated right now. I wish I was up and about preaching this word to your heart and to your life today. The ever-suffering lamb. Notice the extent to which he suffers. It's not just for 33 years on, on planet Earth. It's not just for the experience of writing the book of Revelation, but there's this notion, there's this notion of of eternality to the suffering of the Lamb. Revelation 13, 8 says that the, the Lamb is slain from the creation of the world. And this idea gives us just a small peek into the heart of God and the commitment and the dedication of God to your and my salvation, to the salvation of the human family. Strange though that this slain lamb is standing. And of course, this symbolizes the resurrection. For New Testament writers, the death and the resurrection are one event. The slain lamb is also the resurrected, conquering, triumphant lamb. What good news. What good news today. The lamb has triumphed over death. 
The lamb has taken the very best weapon the enemy could could throw at him. And he took death and he triumphed over death. And so the lamb is both slain and standing. The lamb then is the way God rules the world. In and through the sacrificial death and the incredible resurrection of Jesus. In fact, you know, the symbol of lamb redefines uh, uh, omnipotence and omniscience. The lamb has seven horns symbolizing power. Omnipotence is not to be understood as the power of unlimited coercion, says George Kerr, but as the power of infinite persuasion. The invincible power of self-negating, self-sacrificing love. Wow, this is not beastly power. This is not kingly power. This is power that serves. This is power that gives. This is power that abandons. This is power that lifts up and that picks up. This is power that doesn't stop giving and serving and caring and listening and picking up and supporting and helping. This is a different kind of power. The power that the Lamb has, the seemingly inconsequential Lamb. This is the power that this Lamb has. In a shocking reversal then, the Lamb prevails as a slain standing Lamb. P.T. Forsworth, Christ is to us just what his cross is. All that Christ was in heaven or on earth was put into what he did there. Christ, I repeat, is to us just what his cross is. You do not understand Christ until you understand his cross. John 12, 32, I, if I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. There's the drawing power. There's the drawing power. You know, Jeremiah um, says, God draws us with loving kindness. Uh, any sandwich lovers out there? Uh, you love peanut butter? Maybe you love uh, a nice cheese sandwich or perhaps uh, something else. I'm a pretty simple person. But this idea of God drawing us you know, with loving kindness. Not just peanut butter, peanut butter and jam. <laughs> Not just cheese, cheese and tomato. Not just egg, egg and mayo, and a bit of lettuce. <laughs> what a God we serve. He draws us with loving kindness. And you know, if, if we don't resist, we'll be drawn. We'll be drawn by this immeasurable Amazing love, agape love, the love we see in this lamb, this lamb slain and standing. But let's let's keep going. Uh, you're having uh, you're having fun. I hope. I hope God is ministering into your heart and and drawing you closer to His precious side. Uh, why is the lamb in the center in the center of the throne? Why is the Lamb in the center of the throne? Have a look at uh, Ezekiel 28.14. And of course, Ezekiel speaks to us there of uh, a king who, who rises up, speaking great words against God, symbolically depicting the rise of Lucifer. Lucifer, who wants to rise above God, who wants to take the place of God, usurp the prerogatives of God. That's what Ezekiel 28 is all about. And where does, where does this all commence? Ezekiel 28, 14 says, you, referring, 
referring to Lucifer, you walk in the midst. In the middle of God's throne is where Lucifer began to hurl his insinuations against God. Right there in the middle of the throne is where Lucifer began to began to throw his puny fist in the face of God. So this cosmic conflict begins because God gives his creatures freedom of choice. Because God will not violate the freedom of choice of his, of his creatures. Because he allows them to follow what it is they choose, what it is they purpose, what it is they decide. He will allow them that freedom. And so right there in the center of God's throne, in the center of God's universe, Lucifer begins this cosmic conflict. Right there in the center. So, so, where does God respond? How does God respond? God reveals who he is in the context of Revelation chapter 5. And in the wider context of the cosmic conflict between good and evil, God responds to the beginning of the cosmic conflict at the center of his throne. He responds at the center of the throne with a slain standing lamb, his own son, his own son. There is God's answer. In the cosmic conflict, a slain standing lamb at the center, at the center of the throne. You see, Satan could only be defeated by someone who is weaker than he is. Sin could only be overcome by humility and weakness and brokenness humiliation and suffering, and yes, death, yes, eternal death. That is the only way sin could be conquered by God himself, giving himself in the person of his son to rescue, to redeem, to restore broken, sinful human beings. There is God's answer, a slain standing lamb. What's fascinating is, as we look at Revelation 5, 6, the Lamb is now introduced onto the narrative landscape in the book of Revelation, and the Lamb will now, in fact, open each of the seven seals from Revelation 6 moving onward. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, the Lamb will be once more revealed as controlling events of 14, 15, 16, all the way through to chapter 19. Listen, the Lamb begins to take control of events from from Revelation chapter 5, moving forward, this slain standing lamb. Oh, I wish I could talk to you and communicate to you what it is I'm feeling today. The lamb is in charge in the book of Revelation, and the lamb, the slain standing lamb, is indeed in charge of this planet, in charge of this universe. What a picture, what a symbol. What a symbol of who God is, the way in which God rules the world through the slain standing lamb. And what would a, pardon me for the term, <laughs> what would a lamb of centric reading of Revelation look like? What would a reading of Revelation look like that was focused and absorbed with the slain standing lamb? What would we be like as a people instead of looking to the next headline or the next world leader or the next human organization or the next political entity for guidance and direction as the future unfolds, but rather what would we be as a people, if we were absorbed by the Lamb, what would we look like as a people if our focus was on this slain standing Lamb? 
What would our evangelism look like to the community? What would our meeting of needs be like in this global pandemic if we were a people consumed by the Lamb? What would this Lamb-O-centric reading look like of the book of Revelation, I ask you today? Well, verse 7, verse 7. He went and he took the scroll. Why? Because, because the lamb, the lamb is worthy. Because the lamb has the authority and the prerogatives and the insignia and the nature and the purpose of God. The lamb is very God. So guess what? The lamb can take the scroll and he can open it. And he execute. He can execute and carry out the purpose of God. John Webb, you and I don't need to weep. We don't need to weep because the Lamb is able to take the scroll. So he takes it from the right hand of him who sat in the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. My oh my, my oh my. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. Because the Lamb had triumphed in and through his death and resurrection, he can take the scroll. Because the Lamb is worthy, because of his death and resurrection, he can take the scroll. So notice now verse 9. We're heading to the finish line. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its, listen, this was a universal number one hit. It will always be a universal number one hit. Why? Because it magnifies and glorifies this slain standing lamb. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You've made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Notice this heavenly song sing. They sing a new song. It's new in quality. It's new in nature. Something fundamental has changed in the order of heaven because of the death and resurrection of the Lamb. The government of God has changed. Because of the death and the resurrection of the slain lamb, they sing a song that they've never ever sung before. You are worthy. Because you purchased for God men and women, boys and girls, young people, from every nation, kindred, tongue and people. So what? What's the big deal as we think and reflect on this incredible text today. Number one, in holy awe and wonder at God's marvelous plan to rescue, redeem, and restore the human family. This lamb paid the price for yourself. And listen, I'm speaking to you from uh, Avondale University College in Australia, and I want to tell you what, this slain standing lamb died to pay the price for your brokenness, your failure, your shame, to bring you into the family of God, to adopt you as God's son, to adopt you as God's daughter today. No matter where you've been, what you've done, no matter your mess-ups, no matter your failures, your flops, your weaknesses, your sins, no matter your addictions, no matter where you've been, no matter where you haven't been, this slain, standing lamb took your place took my place on an old rugged cross, triumphed over death, and he's alive today. And he wants to live in your heart, and he chooses to live in my heart today. The death and the resurrection of Jesus, of this this lamb has has reordered heaven. And we ought to join with this, uh, this crescendo of praise to magnify and extol the great God we serve and the sacrifice he has made of himself in the person of this lamb, the slain and standing lamb. 
Number two to that, just as, just as God transformed Judah, God can transform you. You know, that's the greatest miracle happening on the planet today is a transformed life, is a changed heart, is a person delivered from the kingdom of darkness, brought into the marvelous kingdom of light to find Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Let's never, ever, let's never, ever underestimate the transforming power of of the gospel. No matter if you've been brought up in the church, no matter if you've been wandering in the world, no matter if you're a Christian for one week or one month or 10 years or 50 years, let's never underestimate the power of God to transform our hearts and to transform our lives. And again, today, that's God's desire for you. And that's God's desire for me to transform my mind and my heart so that my heart is aligned with the heart of the Lamb, so that my mind is aligned with the mind of the Lamb, so that the way I live my life, you got to think about this, isn't it? The way I live my life, the ministry God has called me to, aligns with the way Jesus lived his life, aligns with the ministry practices and paradigms of Jesus. God desires to transform your heart. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, the Lamb accepts you as you are and can transform and empower you to live a new life, to live a new life. I want to tell you point number three today is that this Lamb is able. That's what the elder said, isn't it? He is able. So many amazing songs in this chapter. He is able. It's been tough in this global pandemic, hasn't it? So many people have lost their jobs, their homes. Mental health has has decreased exponentially across Australia, across America, across the globe. Thousands. Tens of thousands, millions of hurting, broken people. That's not an exaggeration today. And I want to tell you where you are, where you're at in your home, with your family, in your street, in your neighborhood. I want to serve you notice today that God is able. God is able to help you and empower you. If you've lost your job, God's going to help you. If you've lost your business, God is able. If you're struggling with your finances, God is able. If you're struggling in your relationship, God is able. I want to tell you today, you're struggling at uni, God is able. If you're struggling at school, God is able. I want to tell you, you're struggling uh, with, uh, with with that relationship, with that problem, with that difficulty. God is able. He is able today. And I guess I close with this point as uh, I bring my message to a close today to be an agent of reversal as we wrap up. You know, the followers of uh, the big teams today, um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm originally from South Africa, so I'm a, I'm a soccer fan, I'm a cricket fan, I'm a rugby fan, uh, sports that, uh, some sports that you may not be familiar with in the U.S., for example. Um, but, you know, we, we follow teams for their their prowess, their brute force, their skill, you know, the Miami Heat, uh, here it's the Melbourne Storm, it's, uh, what are some of the other big names, the Denver Broncos, uh, you know, I think of, uh, you know, the, uh, the the New York Knicks. In England, uh, in, in the soccer teams I follow, it's, uh, it's, um, it's uh, let me think of some big names, well, it's Arsenal, you know, and, and so I'm a follower of, you know, I'm a follower of uh, the cheaters, the lions, the storm, the heat, the stars. Be a follower of the lamb today. Not brute force, not might, not skill, not prowess, but uh, be a follower of the lamb. Quiet, 
seemingly insignificant, seemingly inconsequential, small, but be a follower of the Lamb and be an agent of reversal. Be an agent of reversal. The lion becomes the lamb. Be an agent of reversal. Where there's brokenness, bring healing. Where there's loneliness, bring friendship. Where there's need, bring a cup of water. Have you noticed that in Matthew 25? Very simple things in that judgment passage. Very simple things. I was naked, brought me clothing. I was thirsty, you brought me water. I was hungry, you brought me food. Be an agent of reversal. It can start with your neighbor. It can start in your street. It can start with your workmate. It can start with your friend at uni. It can start with your classmate. Be an agent of reversal. Be a follower. Be a follower of the Lamb. May God bless you. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you for your time. I know we're all time poor. I know your time is precious. So I want to say thank you. Thank you for listening today. And I pray that God has ministered into your heart through His Holy Spirit, blessed, inspired, drawn you closer to His precious side. And this study has once again brought to you a revelation, revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and the joy of spending time in your holy presence. Thank you for technology. I take uh, my feeble words through technology today. I thank you for Pierre and Eddie, and I pray, Lord, you'll bless this technology, bless this message to touch the hearts of your people, to draw them to your side, inspire them with your powerful and precious Holy Spirit, we ask in the mighty name of Jesus as we follow you, the Lamb. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless and um, continue to follow the Lamb.